Welcome to Church Hurts and the good, the bad, and the ugly about church, religion, and spirituality with a dash of recovery thrown in. If you've ever had questions about the church, maybe a bit jaded in your attitude toward religion, well, you've come to the right place. Our host, he was an honors philosophy student, ordained a Presbyterian minister, planted three churches, taught at a prestigious university, but now, now he's just an aging curmudgeon who never quits asking the question why. The host of Church Hurts and Dr. John Bash. One of the pains of getting older comes in attempting to accept changes even embrace changes, rather than staying stuck in the old ways and acting precisely like the old people at whom you used to roll your eyes. By allowing myself to be stereotyped as an old curmudgeon in the introduction to this show, I guess I've admitted that I don't intend to bend over backwards to embrace the latest trend-setting fashion. Perhaps the most difficult of all changes for me are those that come into the world of ideas and language. I, I knew I was in trouble last November when the Oxford University Dictionary changed the definition of the word woman. Really? How am I to talk if you change the meaning of words on me? This is starting to sound too obtuse. Take the time to watch the 2019 movie entitled The Professor and the Madman with Mel Gibson and Sean Penn. The meaning of words does matter, and it helps as we try to understand and navigate the world around us, not to mention relationships in this world. Now, I can admit to being a bit pedantic about some things, and I know for a fact that our special guest today can be, but at some point, I have to put my foot down and scream, this matters. It isn't just words. It's words. Have I lost you yet? Let me give you mm -hmm. one example, one word, and then mm -hmm. see where it takes us. Ready? Truth. What does the word truth mean? Growing up, I learned that everyone could have opinions, some more right than others, and the essence of a good conversation was exchanging ideas to learn and be influenced by others. All decent people were seeking the truth, so such discussions were outstanding. But something happened. Somebody switched the definition of truth with opinion. Instead of the truth, people were talking about my truth. If I try to explain my confusion any further, I'll confuse myself. So today we have as a guest the author of <laughs> Lifestyle, a biblical philosophical study of Christianity and the culture it produces. Maybe he can help. From Western Ohio, <laughs> welcome, Dr. Richard Canodal to Church Hurts and. Uh, I doubt I can help, John. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I can move my mouth, but um, help comes from the Lord in, in, in a very, very deep and serious way. Well, Dick, um, how did you get to the place? Um, how did we get to the place where truth started to mean something other than truth? You have your doctorate, and and I get all confused by this. So how, how do we get from truth to opinion? Uh, well, in, in our ages, it's simply been the passage of time. And um, philosophy has gone, it's, it's headed more and more the, in the direction of vocabulary and, and, uh, and language. Uh, even when, when we were younger, they didn't really have a view of truth either, but at least they would talk about it. But um, the whole the latter half of the 20th century, <clears throat> 21st century, uh, everything is language philosophy now. And uh, wh what do people mean by the words, even though the words don't have real meaning? Well, um, you, I've, I've titled the show Extreme Truth because to be honest, <laughs> in my life, um, you really are, to the average person, you are really extreme in what you think truth is. 
um, in a whole lot of ways. And, and you're not shy about some real controversial issues you hold. I'm going to get to some of those issues. Um, but you, you really think a lot of your views are based in truth rather than just your personal preferences. You know, would that, would that be accurate? That's that's a hundred percent accurate, and uh, uh, I've had a number of conversations about that with friends, and uh, I I also work as a chaplain, a part time chaplain, one of the hospitals, and so with my superiors there, um, it's uh, it's a little bit bewildering to them to be talking to me, and at least what what they say to me, it's bewildering for the, I can tell it's bewildering for them that they 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 think this guy really believes this stuff. And uh, and I think I think well, what's the alternative? I just <laughs> well, somehow I, I think I think most uh, people believe that their beliefs come from their experiences and their story. So let's at least put you in context. Uh, tell me a little bit about what your life was growing up. Uh, what kind did you grow up in a church home? What what was it like? Uh, I grew up in a church home. But my parents were a good bit more conservative uh, than the church was. So the church, I grew up in the United Presbyterian Church. It was a very liberal church. But they, they, their pastor was a man named McConaughey. And he was, he was an older man when I was a child. But he represented uh, Presbyterianism in the 1930s, roughly the time of J. Gresham Machen. And so he had seen all of that life experience, uh, all that, uh, which was very different, very different than it was even at the time. And in, in the, in the 19, I was born in 1948. So these would have been the 1960s. And um, uh, he was, uh, he was a very, a very old man then. And, uh, but he represented, so the, 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 my parents really believed in prayer. Um, they really believed in Bible reading. Um, and um, but the church was way beyond that. They they simply believed that as long as the ministers kept talking about Jesus, that it was the same Jesus about whom they had faith. And so you got Presbyterian. He sounds like Scott. Was that a Scottish name there? Yeah. Um, well, Scottish. Yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> and 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 then, but my my area was very very secular. But we were, I was upstate New York, and um, I mean, when I became a Christian. I, had, I was I belonged in a class of 700 students, and when I became a Christian, I asked around and I found out that there were only four other students out of that 700 that would would believe the same things that I started to believe then. So it was like I just came from one age into another by the whole, basically by the Holy Spirit. All right, so you talk about becoming a Christian as different from just going to a church. And in um, my experience, that's a big category where people go from kind of a church kind of faith to a personal faith. And you're saying only a handful of kids that you knew kind of made that transition where they said, Oh, this Jesus stuff is real. It's just not part of my family tradition. How did that happen? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I went away to college, and I was uh, in my in my secularism. I was looking for ner, ner, a kind of nirvana. Went down to New York City to Adelphi University, uh, on, on Garden City, Long Island. And um, but I after after a semester, I realized that I really enjoyed college, but it wasn't it wasn't any higher plane. My my high school teachers had really were really used by God to plant this idyllic view in my mind. So I went away looking for that I ideal and I uh, didn't find it the first semester. So I began thinking maybe I should, in my hubris, give the church another chance. <laughs> so I, I considered transferring. I, I ultimately did transfer in the spring. I, I accepted a, uh, 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 provision from Westminster College in New Wilmington, Pennsylvania. I'd never seen the place. That, that happens to be the school that you went to. That's where we met. And But I just thought I'm just going to try to give the church or give the God of my parents another chance to sort of put things together for me. I was really looking. I, I was at the beginning of my life, and I had a sense that I didn't have life together. 
Um, so, let's go back. Let's go back to the God of your parents just for a second, yeah. um, because I think we, in church hurts. You know, we really kind of we we like to be honest about the reasons church hurts, and one of them is people watching the church change over time. They say that was truth, and now they're saying this is truth. But um, for some people, you know, to go back as far as your parents is a long way. So three generations away. Just tell me about how they met, though, because your dad really wasn't the godly one of the two, was he? <laughs> no, the, the, they, their family went to an Episcopal church, which was less evangelical. And um, the, but they um, they met. It's the really bizarre circumstances. They met in a shooting gallery, but it was in the basement of uh, a, a Presbyterian church in Albany, New York. Now, I just, that just cracks me up. If you can imagine a, church, a Presbyterian church today sponsoring a shooting gallery in the basement, and this was common. Of course, this this was back before World War II, and um, culture was very different back then, and um, guns were much were were not the, uh, if I can say, explosive the political thing that they are today, and uh, and so. They met there in the shooting gallery, and uh, it was a pretty conservative for PCUSA, UPCUSA church at the time. Um, but uh, I don't know if that's if that answers your question. Yeah, well, you're dropping initials, and and we have a lot of people who are not oh, church oh, people yeah. who listen yeah, to this. Yeah. So let's just say we're talking about typical in in uh, our lifetime. We've seen the big divide of what they call mainstream churches um, that. Um, pretty much as a whole, have gone in, in much more of a liberal direction. And you ended up going so much the, in reaction to that. <laughs> you not only became a Christian um, and you became a Presbyterian pastor, but then you kept going down. And I can't, I can't even say all the initials in the church that you uh, I know. To. But um, I'm, I want to um, jump ahead. You became a pastor. You plant a couple of churches. You're in the middle of Virginia. Your church is growing. So here you are. And you're not just a pastor. You're actually starting churches in a, in a time when basically the trend is going the other direction. And life was just good being a churchman and believing in Jesus. Everything went great, right? Well, Lynchburg turned out to be kind of an explosive situation. It was a very conservative town. But um, but uh, I, I joke about it that there were uh, two pastors down there, Jerry Falwell and me. And of course, people have heard the, heard of Jerry, but but not Dick uh, Canola. But he called me his Presbyterian friend because as soon as I got down there, there was some pol hot political potato that was on the table, and he and and all the pa all the liberal guys in town were piled up on Falwell. And I thought, well, here I am, a Presbyterian. And I agree with Falwell on this. So I'm going to go in the paper and write an editorial supporting him. And I thought that would be that would promote a lively discussion. Well, I didn't realize anything about the politics of the southern town of Lynchburg at the time. Uh, that was just about gold for Falwell. And a ever after that, he, he, he wanted to meet me, call, called me his Presbyterian friend after that. My, my son, Rich, uh, he, he became a policeman. He ended up being uh, one of Falwell's bodyguards on the Lynchburg, um, on the college of the Liberty University um, um, College uh, police force. So there just a lot of, lot of things happened in between there that, um, that were funny because of Falwell. And, and for uh -huh. a lot of people, that is not a, a credential. You know, they say, Jerry Falwell approved of you. They're going to say, oh, we got to turn the guy off. He really must be extreme <laughs> to the right. And that's yeah. why church hurts is because of people like Jerry Falwell. Yeah. And, and yet he he gave his endorsement of of you, which is pretty, which really is pretty fun. If you funny, if you know the rest of who you are. Yeah. But, I wrote yeah. a, I, I wrote an article in the, in one of the reform magazines and back in those days called, it was titled a, a Calvinist in Falwell land. And one of the, the prize sentences of that was, I said, the more we talk about politics, the more we agree, the more we talk about religion, the more we disagree. <laughs> so this is for two clergymen, you know, so it was, it was really funny. And for a lot of people, this discussion is part of just the church hurts. They hate the politics stuff. They hate the mixing it. And they hate all the differences. You, you got the Reformed this and the Baptist this, and you got all those names. So I want to get to something real here. 
because something happened in your life. You guys were were praying about having another child and adopting a child years before that, mm-hmm. and and you really thought God had answered your prayers. T- tell me about that experience. Well, it was an it was a, an idealistic stage of our lives. We were just we're a young couple in our twenties, and we thought, why should we have more children? than when there are already unhappy children, abandoned children in the world at this time. So we, we thought we would pick up one of these little abandoned kids and, uh, and then maybe have some more of our own after that. So we ended up adopting a child uh, from Colombia, And we actually went down there. We lived down there for about a month. And um, it, was, it was great fun. We, 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 uh, we went, we thought we were going to get a little girl because we had uh, a boy at that time uh, but uh, we ended up having all boy had no one more child after carl uh, christopher so rich rich carl and christopher and um but um we we ended up not having a choice in <laughs> god's in god's foreordination i guess he wanted us, us to have boys and um and uh so uh, i'm and trying carl, to kind of carl was, yeah. carl was a lot of fun and Carl was a lot of work and mm-hmm. um, he had his own demons. Talk about that. Yeah. Uh, almost uh, when, as soon as we got home, there were, there were signs that manifested themselves very quickly. For instance, he had really, he was mostly Indian in, in Colombia. You have um, three different races represented uh, blacks, whites, and Indians. And they, then there's the intermixture the more toward the interior you get, the more the Indians would, the Indian race with the native race in that area would manifest itself. So Carl had this very straight jet black hair, very thick. First time we bathed him in the tub, Susan calls me into the bathroom. She says, Dick, you need to see this. So her, his head was wet and, and you could see through the hair. And all of a sudden you could see all of these scars in the top of his head that you couldn't see. And so we knew that he'd been severely beaten as a little, we got him at three years old, roughly. And so before three, he had all of these head scars. It was it almost, uh, almost brought us to tears immediately. And then uh, we, we saw a lot of behavioral characteristics that, you know, we knew the things that he, he was not normal in the, in, in, a, in, a, in the sense of just a naive child. I, I had him on my, I balanced on my hip and my right leg going up the stairs of the manse at that time. And my, I had a little office under one, underneath the, uh, the eave of a roof. And I'd hung a light bulb off the top of the roof or under the un- underbelly of the roof hang- hanging over the desk. So I've got him on balanced on my hip and we get to the desk and I'm reaching, looking for some papers. He reaches out before I could say anything and grab the light bulb <clears throat> with his bare hand. I pulled it back, <laughs> pulled it back right away. Not a sound. Carl did not show any signs of pain, which is, of course, that's indicative of a certain psychological uh, awareness or a, a bent of behavior. So then the next thing I know, he's taking his other little hand and pushing it beside my head toward the light bulb to see if when my face hits that bulb, if I'll react the same way that he did, you know. So it's just a little three year old type, you know, but we we knew right away. I mean, he didn't show pain. Um, then when he feels pain, he wants to see if you'll feel pain. <laughs> That's uh, it's just not normal. And so and then that abnormalcy manifested itself throughout his life he didn't he really couldn't internalize uh, other people's affection you could you'd love him you'd you'd hug him and that sort but he didn't really didn't feel that in his heart and so he grew up very very lonely and there there were the the, it's it's terribly damaging to be that lonely in life the end of that story is sad yeah he's mid-30s and we had been afraid for years that we were going to get a call someday from the sheriff or the police department that he had killed himself and um and we did one day and uh he was in his uh, mid-30s and it was a sheriff and he's you know just gave us the word i'm sorry mr canole to to tell you but your son has committed suicide and uh beside 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 his body there were two contraries there was an open bible and there was a revolver with a spent cartridge in it Mm -hmm. and um 
and Carl was gone. So um, we had we had challenged him repeatedly throughout his life. I mean, we just prayed and prayed and tried to get his attention because we just knew that he he just needed help, and uh, it was beyond what we could give him because it had to do with him and his own heart and what he felt. And we thought we we knew that God could make these basic changes in a person, um, but He's about the only one. That's for fundamental for changes that fundamental. You know, Dick, no matter how strong you believe, no matter how strong any of us believe, those kind of things has to, have to cause you to pause. And you, mm. you have to make sense somehow of your faith in light of the reality of a very rude world, don't you? Yeah, um, you know, you, you and that's things like that. You either take the Bible's representation of reality, or you take another another uh, view of reality that something that you might come up with in your mind, something that other people come up with. Um, this this business of evil, you know, it, it it comes from somewhere. Well, if without without the Lord, I don't. You really can't even tell what what is evil. You can't that that word itself is beyond description because to describe evil you've got to have some view of the good and uh, if good is the result of my opinion or group opinion it's not really it's not really good it's not really evil it's just a it's just the way the animals are snarling or or snorting on a certain day uh, animals without any reason who are on some celestial speck in the sky you know and so but if you if you accept the lord in his definitions well then you can have a real value system and a reality that spins out from that. I want to hear another story from you, but before I do, let me just take a break to mention uh, Standing Stone Ministry. Uh, Standing Stone cares for the frontline workers in the spiritual world, ministers, missionaries, recovery specialists. We provide an arm to lean on, an ear to listen, understanding from experience with unceasing prayer. This is all done with no cost to those Standing Stone, uh, working with Standing Stone shepherds because of your faithful gifts. I am one of those shepherds who depends on your support. And so we would humbly ask you to consider giving today. Just go to churchhurtsand.org, click on the donate button and find out how you can help today. And then please prayerfully consider marking that box, which asks if you want to make it a regular gifts. Your gifts mean more than you know, and we promise that we will squeeze every penny. You know, Dick, as we're talking about these things, um, I think, and just having said that about Standing Stone, as I work with pastors, one of the things I find is the the pain they go through themselves sometimes is the exact thing that gives them power in helping others in hard times. And, and but you, you had a one, two punch. Um, tell me about the other experience in your life, which really was a sobering one. Yeah. Before I do though, though, let me give a plug for standing stone because I, as just as you were mentioning that, John, I thought, wow, there's a, a pastor that I know right now, that uh, really needs to at least have that as an option. So I'm, I'm going to just wrote a note to myself. I'm going to send him um, a recommendation that he might use you as a resource because when these things happen in our lives, uh, there, aren't, there are not a whole lot of people that you can turn to. And, so um, true. So, so yeah, yeah. yeah, the, the one-two punch, uh, the, Carl, uh, Carl um, killed himself in about 2012 and um, this other incident happened in 1990 and it was an accident that we had on the way to church camp i was i was taking junior high kids to church camp in our van and um, um, carl was driving and um, that was another antecedent cause that led i think led to his depression that then the 1990 to 2012, uh, that was, so that's about uh, 20 years um, for him. But um, this uh, this van crash was just terrible because it was just a typical drive to camp with a, with a church. We were trying to help the students, so these junior high kids, get to a camp in Pennsylvania from from uh, Central Virginia, 
And um, it happened at 7.30 in the morning. It was light. There were no, uh, no rain, no problems. It just that Carl nodded off for just a moment at the wheel. And um, uh, our right wheel then, um, or our left wheel, I guess the, 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 the van started off the road. I heard gravel under the, under the uh, I was, I was uh, sleeping in the front seat. Um, heard gravel under hitting the bottom of the car from the, the right wheel. And at that moment, almost immediately, the left wheel caught the side, the guardrail along uh, Route 81 going up through central, or in central Virginia, but a little bit more north of Lynchburg. And um, we went down this long ravine, the, the, the van uh, started tumbling over and over. And um, two of the two of the kids, or two of the girls, and oh, they were amongst the best kids that I'd ever I've ever known. Uh, but they didn't have their seatbelts on, and um, so they got flipped out, flipped out of the van, and um, and uh, ended up uh, dying there. And so, you know, I went from sleeping peacefully in the in a car seat to. Um, having to call two parents who I loved, two sets of parents who I really loved and, and tell them that there we'd, <laughs> we'd had an accident and uh, both of their children were dead. And you can see it, it just affects me even to this day. I just uh, never been able to uh, get over it. And, um, um, uh, but uh, I, I looked at when it happened, I got, I got out of the, a van and tried to take a, a meeting, uh, an instant recollection of uh, or evaluation of of what everything looked like, and um, I could see a couple of uh, well, uh, the two kids that got thrown out of the vehicle. I could see them quickly, and then I just uh, looked up into the heavens and I said, "I know, Lord, that my life will never be the same. Uh, be my God." in the midst of this and help us to get through. And then I started off, I gave one of the kids, uh, or if it, I, I could see that one of them was deceased already. I, I ran to the other. Um, I thought she was still alive, but she was actually just having what I know now are death gasps. I gave her CPR for about half an hour because we would, we, we had gone down this, into this gulch and nobody, nobody even knew we were down there for a while. The, the, the couple of the boys, one of them being my son, ran up to 81 and tried to flag people down, finally got somebody to stop. And this was before cell phones. So um, uh, I didn't have a phone to call, but somebody, somebody did have an early phone they called. And so, but it took a took, took quite a while for the police to get there in the emergency vehicles. Uh, but it Dick, was, uh, it was devastating. Dick, it's those kind of things where People are just waiting to hear Romans 8, 28, or, you know, I mean, all things work together for good for those who love God. And you want to curse. You want to say that that's not true. And you believe the Bible's true. And yet, man, that doesn't seem like anything good sometimes. And if there's a God, how can he allow such things to happen? Tell me about your extreme truth when the extreme in the other direction seems like extreme madness occurs. Yes, in, in the book of Job, uh, one of the one of the real themes of Job is that Job went through these terrible circumstances himself, where most of his family was killed, and he he went from being a very rich man to having everything destroyed around him. And yet he refused to curse the Lord. And he said, uh, uh, the Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And when, um, when you think that, when you can say that God is good, when he's devastated your life, that is the essence of faith. Uh, because you, you don't say that just because you're suggesting it or you're trying to get yourself to believe it. You're saying that because you really feel it, you really believe it. and. Uh, Psalm 107 is like that too. Over and over again, there's the, there is the refrain, um, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. And the psalmist, that, that's repeated, I think, seven times. That's, um, that is 
that's not stupid. The, the, the psalmist knows all about these things. And um, David was one of the most prolific of the psalm writers, and he lost a child. Uh, he had sinned with Bathsheba, had Uriah killed. So he was, he was well aware of reality and how sin can skew our lives right to the death. But uh, experientially, you can, and, 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 and seeing the word of God, you can come to that place where you really trust the Lord despite his negative providences. And there's nothing more negative than losing a child and um, just having your life turned upside down. And the, the, the special grief for me was that I, I just had done everything in my life to that point to try to help other people. That was one of the reasons I was in the ministry, wanted to help other people. And here at that point, though, I had been an agent for the death of a child and that twice over. So it was just devastating to me. I, I, I couldn't drive for weeks. And when I went out finally and drove the car, uh, I couldn't drive the speed limit. I just uh, I felt so totally conflicted. But I did know that God was good. I never had any doubts about the Lord, uh, despite the confusions of my providence. You know, Dick, I should have known it was going to go like this. We barely scratched the surface and, and our time's up. But um, it just, it seems to me that what I'm hearing is your belief that God is good was not going to be shaken by the craziness of the world that we live in. There's a time when all this is going to be put straight and if we don't believe that, then this is really a mean, mean place to live. Uh, but yeah. I, let me at least let you let, just turn, and, and though it's so heavy, it's hard to do, but let me just turn for a second and mention, as you navigated those waters and you helped a lot of people by navigating it honestly and really and not sticking your head in the sand, but you recently had kind of the joy because I introduced myself as an old curmudgeon. You're older than me. And you got to the place that you actually shot your age on the golf course. Uh, give me the one minute joy of that. Uh, well, uh, shooting par golf is, is very hard really. And, um, and I just, I didn't think I was going to be able to do it. I, I knew as you, the older you get, you get uh, the a par golf is 72. So the older you get and you get into your seventies then and above your seventies, then it's easier and easier to shoot your age. But of course you're physically, you're deteriorating. So there's two vectors that are going and they cross somewhere. But I was, I think I was 71, 70 or 71. And, um, I was off on vacation on Cape Cod and uh, just, it was a very relaxing day. I started to string some pars together and, uh, and uh, I just, there wasn't a single green that I either didn't hit or come close to. And my chipping game, putting game was on. And um, so I, I might've got a couple of bogeys, but I got a couple of birdies too. And here I, you know, I finished and I didn't even think about shooting, a, shooting my age, but I was just so, I was basking in the beauty of such a great round of golf. And uh, all of a sudden it came to me that you're, you're, I think I was 71 and I'd shot a 70 and uh, I thought, Oh my word. And then I, I realized that I'd done what I thought was the impossible up to that point. <laughs> well, let me just say this before I close. I don't know many people in life more conservative than Dick Knodel. I don't know, certainly don't know anyone who's a thoughtful conservative as much as Dick Knodel, and I mean that theologically and politically. And I also know that for virtually all of my life, that if I was in need, I could call Dick Knodel. Dick, thank you. Do you have any friends who are unpredictable, strong-willed, opinionated, <laughs> maybe a bit too honest, and certainly challenging to the status quo? <laughs> many people I don't know. Don't. I, I don't know which side of you you're on, John. But <laughs> <laughs> many there people you go. don't. <laughs> Facebook unfriending is a perfect example of this. I always cringe when I see a post threatening to unfriend those who don't fit into a category, which makes the Facebook member uncomfortable. If you are voting for Trump, I'm going to block you. If you are a Democrat, 
go try to buy a brain with your welfare check. You get the idea. Some of us have friends who think as we do, play as we do, vote as we do, or go to the same kind of churches, country clubs, or the agnostic, I don't care societies. We get confused about how others can see things so differently, angry at the news when we see those others making waves, spouting their distaste for our way of living, believing, and voting, living in a modern culture that seems to want to talk a lot about people's national origins, cultures, racial identity, sexual preferences, and victimization possibilities. I regret that the discussion of ideas and truth seems to be taking a back seat. I've noticed that gravity doesn't seem to care about such things. It's real. <laughs> it's truth. Newton's law of gravitation doesn't have a letter in its formula to account for such things. A Scottish lass is going to fall at the same speed as a Pakistani sheik. The seeking of truth has been the pursuit of thinkers since the beginning of time. What is truth? And then how do things work? Is there something beyond this material world? Can we find a unifying purpose? What happens when we die? In my lifetime, I've seen a complete change in the popular discussion about truth. Science is viewed as the only field with access to real truth. As the dynamics of the material world are weighed, quantified, and put into formulas, and then tested with the scientific method. If you can't put it under a microscope, taste, touch, or smell it, it must just be your opinion or now your truth. I look forward to the day when the bigger truths are valued again, when people with different viewpoints help us to think instead of be repulsed. I look forward to people discovering that God and the spiritual world are more real than gravity and seek, and seek to have their God correspond to the God the great I am, proclaimed in every faithful church without apology. I leave you, with, leave you with two quotes, one from an American preacher and one from a British politician. Warren Wearsby said, truth without love is brutality, and love without truth is hypocrisy. And then Winston Churchill said, men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing had happened. It's worth a thought for <laughs> church hurts and this is John Bash. Go and enjoy God today, won't you? Well, that was worth a thought for sure. And brings us to the end of this edition of Church Hurts and. Next week, it's rumored we'll be walking on the edge of controversy, stirring the pot of denial, and finding movement of the divine. Our host, Dr. John Bash, is a shepherd with Standing Stone, a nonprofit ministry committed to caring for pastors and Christian leaders at risk of leaving the ministry prematurely. Come visit us at churchhurtsand.org. Tell us your story while you're there. Until then, remember, Church Hurts isn't the end of the story. Now go into the end and enjoy God today, won't you?